<laughs> and I got to ask you this question. You are a brilliant and profound social thinker. You are an intellectual and a man of ideas. You are a, a prophetic witness on behalf of ideals that you embrace. What do you think makes you fit to run the country? I've said before, you'd find me in a crack house before you find me in the White House. You know, I've said that many, many occasions because the White House has been tied to so much corruption and war crimes abroad, be it Vietnam or Iraq or other places. Uh, but I do feel a certain calling to allow the legacy that has shaped me of Martin King and Rabbi Heschel and Dorothy Day and Edward Zaid, and it goes on, Grace Lee Boggs, and, because I'm thoroughly convinced that there is the best of America, and I want to reintroduce America to the best of itself. And the best of itself is people of integrity, honesty, courage, who are fundamentally committed to the least of these poor and working people. It's the government of the United States of America. It's a massive, massive thing. You can't get anything done by yourself. You say you be, prefer to be in a crack house than in the White House. The White House is not actually running the show, not on, not on, on its own. It, it's providing some direction, but it, it's not. It's at the pinnacle of a, a massive uh, bureaucratic structure. You got the other party. You got the Congress. You got the court. Is it, a, is it not a quixotic enterprise, one where it's full of symbolism, but where it doesn't actually touch the ground? How, how are things going to be made better in virtue of this candidacy? You're not going to win, excuse me, with respect. You never know. You never know, brother. It's hard okay. to say. You know, Biden's All been right. over. Right. Trump might drop the mediocre folk on the Republican side. The Democrats have very little. You never know how God works and how history proceeds. But you're right. The chances don't look good. Again, I'm not naive about this thing. I run for the presidency trying to ensure first that there is a public debate and public conversation that focuses on those you spent so much time on in the last 20 years or so, those in mass incarceration, those in the hood and the ghettos and so forth. And then how that's connected to, you know, the military industrial complex and the imperial presence of 800 military bases around the world and U.S. troops in over 150 countries, how that's connected to not having enough resources to deal with the elimination of poverty and homelessness, to deal with decent housing, to deal with quality schools to deal with health care for all, and then to deal with those personal and spiritual issues you've always been concerned about, often associated with personal responsibility, which is stronger families, stronger civic institutions, so people can straighten their backs up and try to be persons of caring. Let's suppose I'm, you know, a white guy running a small company in the middle of Ohio, Indiana, Nebraska, somewhere. Yes. I vote Republican, but I don't necessarily feel good about it. I love my country, whatever I mean by that. I love my God. I'm a straight arrow. And, and I'm listening to your prophetic witness. And what I see is a radical. I, I see, I'm sorry, a Marxist. That's what they're going to say. Uh, I see a guy who shows up, ambulance chaser, like, excuse me, with respect. But that's what they're going to say at every demonstration with a protest sign. Uh, and who's going to spout this rhetoric? What I know is that the world is a dangerous place, that there are forces at work other than American empire that necessarily don't mean my grandchildren any good, that hard calls have to be made when they fly planes into office towers. Things have to be done in response to that. Of course, there are questions about what's wise, but to adopt an armchair posture, again, this is the voice of this guy, I want you to respond to it, of uh, castigating the American project toot court because, quote, we have made mistakes, close quote. When I know, I know that the defeat of the Nazis in the Second World War was the right side winning. I know that the retirement of the arsenal of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics actually advanced human freedom in the uh, largest sweep of history, notwithstanding the fact that the United States has done things to set human freedom back. Please talk to me. Don't, don't talk at me. T tell me why it is that I should be persuaded by this radical vision that you're giving such eloquent voice to. No, at first I was uh, with the Prussian white brother that you noted. I would say that there's the best in us and there's the worst in us. I would say that I'm fundamentally concerned about his situation and predicament. And I would say I want to learn and listen just as I have something to say to him. He has something to say to me. I would say he is who he, who he is because somebody loved him. I am who I am because somebody loved me. And therefore, I'm concerned about 
is access to a job with a living wage. I'm access to safe neighborhood. I'm access to health care, access to quality education for him and his children, and that we have much in common because we're part of a project of living in the United States. And the United States has its worst, which is its imperial presence abroad, let alone all of the various forms of domination. And America has its best, those who resisted it and those who preserved their dignity and resilience in the face of it. So I would put myself on a human level. That's why I'm going to spend some good time going into Trump country, brother. I approach each person not as a stereotype, uh, not as some kind of construct, but as a very precious human being who has their own lens through which they view the world. And I have my lens through which I view the world. And we attempt to come together and see where we overlap. And you're right, it is a dangerous place. The world's a dangerous place, always has been, always will be. You know, the hounds of hell are always dominating the species of, of, of hatred and fear and envy and resentment. But thank God we've got moments of interruption. That's what love is all about. That's what justice is all about. And you know how fragile any democratic experiment is. And the question becomes, how do we try to preserve the best of it? And I think I can find some common ground with that white brother, even if we ended first talking about sports and music a little bit, or maybe talk about his mama and I tell him about mine so we can make a genuine connection. But then the political discussion would begin. But I, uh, but if they, if they came in and said, well, I'm a Marxist and I'm a radical, well, no, first I'm a mama's child and daddy's kid just like you. Then they say, oh, I hear you're a Christian. You're a Christian. You couldn't be a Marxist. Well, I'm the kind of Christian that believes that a critique of capitalism is very important, but Marx is wrong on a lot of things. So I think there's a way in which I can make that connection, my brother. I gather that uh, you're not expecting an endorsement from former President Barack Obama as you seek to become the second African-American <laughs> elected to that <laughs> <Right>. high office. <laughs> did, you, did you hear what he said yesterday, though? Oh, God bless About Tim Scott? Oh, Lord. Jim Scott better have a plan to hit transgenerational poverty and deal with racial inequality. He got to walk the walk and talk the talk. What a self-criticism. What a self-indictment. Dabba Smiley and I had a poverty tour twice trying to get him to use the word poverty. And we were trashed by the White House folk. We also tried to raise issues of mass incarceration, raise the issues of poor in, in, in barrios and reservations pushed aside, viewed as traitors, and now he's going to say exactly the same thing about Brother Tim Scott? Come on, Brother Barack. Man, we were born that night, but not last night, man. <laughs> I know you've heard the criticism, third-party candidacy, it just draws support away from uh, the Milk toast Democrats that you use. <laughs> but after all, even a milk toast Democrat is better than, you know, the other alternatives, say these critics. And uh, they remember Ralph Nader 2000 and all of that. And uh, they, they want to know what's your plan? You know, what's your what's your long term plan in terms of uh, the weighty election and, and the role that you might play in it, if, even if you're successful? And securing the Green right. Party nomination. And even if you attract a non-trivial amount of support, the chances that you would prevail in the electoral process are slim. But the consequences of your effort could be very, very significant. How do you answer that? If you think that American politics will forever be the oscillation between Republicans and Democrats, then any attempt to break out is viewed as being a spoiler. Now, I think that's an unfortunate term that when you actually look at Al Gore, you know, he didn't even carry his own congressional district of Tennessee. He didn't carry Arkansas. And he could have actually fought when it went to the Supreme Court. He refused to fight. You might remember that when Jesse Jackson Jr. in the caucus tried to convince him to, to follow through. The idea of putting that on somebody who, who received such few votes relative to the two parties to me, is simply a, a rationalization. They say the same thing about Sister Jill Stein. She got 1% of the votes, but she received full responsibility for why Hillary Clinton lost. No, Hillary lost. She was a mediocre candidate. She didn't go to West Virginia. She called ordinary Americans deplorables and irredeemables, and therefore she did not win. It wasn't because of Jill Stein. You see what I mean? 
So I, I, I don't like that kind of uh, framework. Uh, I do think there has to be some very practical reflections and practical judgments, not just Machiavellian ones uh, that have to do with numbers, but also practical ones in terms of the impact of various administrations on, on people. And I, I, to me, that is a factor, but it's not the sole factor. It's not the sole factor. You know, you just have to be ready to get hit with all kinds of bows and arrows, my brother. Some of them are strong and you learn from them and some of them are just empty and false and pseudo because people are trying to foreclose any broader discussion. I'm convinced the two-party system, the two parties in place, do not speak to the basic needs of poor and working people. Now, if that's the case and I'm committed to poor and working people, I got to follow my call. 